All right. So, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Mullen. I am a mentor with 4795 eSpots. I was a student on the team uh, for a few years from 2013 to 2016. Graduated, took a bit of a break, volunteered as a, a CSA and inspector. Uh, and uh, I work now at the uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab as an electrical engineer in Maryland. So uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, kind of the basics of Swerve, and some tips if, you know, this is your first year switching to it. Um, you know, and why are we doing this? Uh, Swerve is, is, you know, increasingly important. It's been a competitively viable option for a long time, but it's becoming more and more common uh, and, you know, almost required to hit a certain level of competitive performance. So I want to kind of, you know, make it as easy as possible on everyone to understand the basics and then kind of make sure that what they have is working uh, for, for, you know, this year, or if you're switching next year, or if you've already been doing it, you know, see if we can, you know, make that even better. So, you know, we switched last year. Um, I've been a tank true believer for a long time. The students convinced me last year uh, and they were right, right? It, uh, it really helped us uh, take our competitive performance to the next level in a way that we probably would not have been able to achieve on tank drive last year. Uh, so also just to note, all of this presentation assumes that we're going to have a flat field game where tank drive is viable. That sandwich. Um, yeah, so this assumes that we're going to have a, a you know game where tank drive is, or swerve drive is viable. If we end up having a 2016 game like Stronghold, all bets are off and most of this is basically a moot point. So let's stick with that assumption for now. And if it doesn't come to pass, then deal with that when we, when we deal with it. Um, at any point, just throw questions in the chat or I'll, I'll kind of ask to unmute it at various points if you all have anything. So very basics, most of y'all probably know this, but what is for a drive? It's, an, um, it's a drive system that lets you move in any direction and turn at the same time uh, all at once, kind of completely independently. So you can go forward, backward, left, right, and turn all at once uh, with the traction of a tank drive, but all the maneuverability of a mechanic drive, right? Now, this comes at a significant cost and complexity trade-off. Uh, you now need eight drive motors, four to control each module's kind of the, the steering angle of the wheel, and then four more motors to control uh, the driving speed of each wheel. So... Before, honestly, 2010, 2019, 2020, it was really only elite teams that were seeing significant competitive success with this. Um, but that has changed a lot since then. It has changed very rapidly. And we're going to go over some of, you know, what's what's made that happen. But that's just kind of a high level overview of what is Swerve. Um, there's going to be a lot of acronyms in this. I uh, just kind of want to go over a few. Uh, most of these are probably familiar to y'all. Um, the COPS is common off the shelf, something you can buy. Some of the vendors we'll be talking about, SDS is Swerve Drive Specialties, are kind of the most popular Swerve Drive vendor. Uh, West Coast Products is WCP. CTRE is more of an electronics manufacturer, cross-road electronics. They make a lot of the accessories and the motor controllers that are common. Um, TPU is a material that some teams are starting to use now on tires. It's a, it's a flexible filament. Uh, and then PDH, PDP, Power Distribution Hub, which is kind of the new rev thing with more slots in the PDP, uh, which is the old power distribution panel uh, with, with kind of fewer slots. Uh, all right, so let's look at how Swerve has evolved in North Carolina. Now, okay, I was not in first before 2014, but I'm pretty sure there were not any sort of drives in the state of North Carolina before then. Uh, 2015, Team 900 and 1533 really kicked us off with uh, the 221 Revolution modules, which were kind of the first commonly available modules. They were solid. They had some problems, but they they worked, right? They worked, and then those teams used them to, to fairly decent effect. Uh, 2017, Triple Strange ran kind of their iconic Strange Swerve. Uh, which is their custom swerve that they developed from 20, uh, 2017, I think, through 2022. Uh, and they were kind of the dominant force in North Carolina with Swerve Drive, right? They won four, four district championships in like six years. Uh, 
2019, we saw a couple more teams running it for the first time at dist- uh, at, um, in that game with uh, some, some custom modifications to actually climb on their swerve modules that year. Uh, but since 2019, it has taken off kind of an insane amount, right? 2020, so this is a chart of what percentage of teams at district championships had swerve drive, right? We're, 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 you know, a few teams, a few teams, a few teams. And now we're well over half of teams at district championships are running swerve. And 75% of teams in playoffs at district championships last year were running swerve. So that is honestly an insane jump from just a few years past. Uh, now, I will say, it's not just that Swerve makes you automatically competitive and able to do these things. There is definite, you know, correlation between the teams that have the kind of money and means to do Swerve well and means to, you know, create effective mechanisms. So there is some, some, you know, uh, correlation that isn't causation there. But, uh, you know, bottom line, Swerve is more and more important and and kind of uh, it's only going to keep getting that way. And I will note that. Almost every, uh, if not every team that was tank drive or mechanism drive in playoffs of district championships last year has already switched uh, or is planning to for this year. Um, I'm not sure about all of them, but I'm, I, I looked at most of them and I think most of them that I could see were already planning on a switch. So just kind of giving you an indication of what we might be looking at for 2024. Um, this is tongue in cheek, but you know, for a long time, this was the way eSpots thought, right? Um, you know, 254 mentor when asked why they didn't do swerve said anything that moves sideways is a waste of time. Hyperbole, yes, but also we agreed that the best drive train we could make was something that we could bang out in our sleep, which for us was a tank drive and spend all our time focusing on mechanisms. Um, fast forward a few years later, and now the same team is saying, yeah, you kind of need to move sideways. So, you know, this is where we're going. So, you know, a little bit of how did we get here, right? What changed to make Swerve, you know, this viable and important, right? Because like I said, I was a true believer that, you know, we eSpots is never going to move sideways. We are going to be tank drive till the cows come home. Uh, but, you know, FRC changed on us, right? Swerve Drive Specialties releasing reliable modules that were fairly affordable was a game changer. Uh, the new PDH has 24 ports to plug things in. The old PDP only had 16, and when eight of your boat, your power slots are tied up by drivetrain, that le- means you actually have to make some trade-offs because you can't just have as many mechanism motors as you want or, you know, sensors or coprocessors as you want. Now that uh, there are 24 ports, you really don't have to make trade-offs anymore. You can just have all the mechanisms you want and all the drive motors you want. Uh Rev and CTRA VEX releasing brushless motors, right? It used to be that the most powerful drivetrain you could get was a six motor tank drive. Uh, with more powerful motors, the advantage of six the motors over four became incredibly marginal. So now a robot with four sword modules no longer was at a power deficit. The software improved on us a lot uh, and teams were releasing better and better software that just kind of worked. Whereas before, you know, you look at 1533 and 900 as the only teams that were doing it. Those are two teams that are excellent at software with capabilities that are, you know, more advanced than what most teams, including ESPOS, most of the time is doing. Um, That and COVID gave teams a chance. It gave teams like a year where they could finally say, okay, we're not competing this year. We have the time to figure this out for real. So that's kind of why you see that massive jump in 2022 and 2023. It's a combination of these reasons. Uh, that's why we are where we are. So if you're, you know, if you're planning on doing tank right now and you're looking at doing swerve um, and are wondering, is it too late to buy it now? And I, I think, I, I hope most of you, if you're planning on doing swerve for this year, have already bought it and ideally already have it working. Um, if not, I would say it is probably too late for this season, unless, uh, you're kind of willing to make trade-offs and have a, you know, a good resource base, right? So you need money. It's fairly expensive. Um, if you're a team that, you know, tends to have good electrical skills, has good electrical students and mentorship and software students and mentorship, um, and are willing to make some sacrifices in your build process to build a simpler robot to account for a more complicated drivetrain, 
and to be able to get your drivers, you know, an hour of drive practice a week to get them to adapt from tank drive to swerve drive. If you kind of have all of those things and you're willing to do it um, and are willing to make those trade-offs, then I think you can switch even now. Um, but if not, I think it's best to just kind of wait a year, save money, use the kit of parts drive train, save up and do it in the off season, maybe run it at Thor uh, to try and work out some of the bugs that, you know, I think most teams have have some bugs in their first event. I know we certainly did, right? Um, and I really do think that with where we are, every team should, if they're not already switching to Swerve, they should consider switching to Swerve by, by next season. Um, I don't particularly like that this is where FRC is. I think that FRC is better and more accessible when tank drive is a viable option, um, especially because, you know, the kit of parts is tank drive, right? Uh, it's presented as the default option. I want that to remain competitive, but I think we kind of, we have to be honest and, and, and say that we might be finding it difficult two to three years down the road to even make playoffs at, at regular district events uh, without Swerve Drive, unless first does something to rein it in, which I don't really think they'll do as a rules change. They might have a game that makes Swerve kind of bad, but um, if you're not doing it now, I think that by next year you should be planning on it, um, or, or at least you know thinking about whether you have the resources to make that work for you. Uh, I'll say that from our perspective, Tank Drive by 2023 was all, you know, not so much 2022, but by last year, Tank Drive was already a negative when we were making our pick lists, right? Um, it was more difficult to navigate around at a constrained field. It was a lot harder to align with Tank Drive. And if we needed a Tank Drive robot to play defense on other Swerve Drive robots, the Swerve Drive robot was at a significant advantage, right? Um, and then you look at, honestly, two of my favorite teams, 971 and 3357. These are two teams that are way better at engineering than eSpots. Like, oh my God, the robots they build are incredible. And they struggled at, at, at the champ world championships because they were on tank drive, right? So if teams with significantly better engineering than us and significantly better mechanisms than us are struggling with tank drive, um, well, that makes me very sad because I love tank drive. But again, kind of points to where we're going. I will note, uh, a well-driven, practiced tank drive robot is still going to be competitive at district events this season. District champs, I'm not sure. But if your you know, kind of goal is, hey, I want to be in playoffs at district events, I want to be an alliance captain at district events, a well-practiced, well-driven, reliable tank robot is still going to be able to do that this year. Next year, I'm not so sure. Um, okay, so let's jump in. So any questions so far on kind of, you know, the overall why Swerve Drive, um, what is Swerve Drive, or just, you know, any of kind of the overall thoughts on, on you know, where FRC is and where it's going with regards to this? Put it in chat or just unmute and ask. All right. So yeah, let's talk about modules. Um, this is kind of a, a you know an overall comparison of the three major modules and really the only ones that I would recommend buying. Uh, you've got from Rev, you've got Maxwerve. This is the cheapest option by far. It is absolutely tiny. This is the way Spots runs. You look here, there is so much space on that robot. It is a tiny module, it is cheap, uh, and it works very well. Um, it does have three inch wheels, which comes with a bit of a, a you know, uh, disadvantage in certain areas, but uh, this is sort of the easiest option and in some ways the best first swerve sort of drive to do, especially if you are, you know, a little resource constrained like we were last year. Um, then you've got West Coast Products Swerve X modules. These are larger, heavier, more expensive, uh, but have some advantages we'll get into. And then kind of the gold standard that almost everyone in North Carolina is on is Swerve sort of Drive Specialties, the MK4, MK4i. It's the most expensive of the bunch. It's pretty big, it's pretty heavy, but you're getting things that are worth it for that money. Uh, so let's kind of dive in more in depth than any, to all, in, you know, each and every one of these. So Maxworth, this is what eSpots has. Uh, and we we absolutely love it. We, you know, we're thrilled with it. Uh, it was, this is sort of, you know, kind of what I call it is, is this is the Apple of Apple product of Swerve Drives. It kind of just works. Um, 
it does lock you in in some ways to doing everything the way Rev wants you to do it. But the benefit is that it just works. Their software kind of just works out of the box. It requires the least tuning, the least setup, uh, and it, it's really well packaged, extremely nice form factor, gives you so much belly pan and mechanism space. Um, it also includes multiple gear ratios all in the same package, which means that you can gear your robot to go slower or faster uh, without paying extra money. It's definitely got the best software and electrical support, and I think Rev support in general is top notch. Uh, now, CTRE is, is following up in that, uh, and it kind of just comes in alignment, Jake, and like I said, all the tools you need to get it running and an instruction manual that just kind of works. Uh, some cons to this are that it's a newer module. It came out last year for the first time. We haven't seen how Rev Swerve might deal with falling from the traversal rung in 2022, right? How happy is this thing after it falls from eight feet in the air? We don't know the we don't know that yet, right? So uh it's a little less battle tested than the others. And Rev's we plastic wheels last year kind of struggled. Um they they liked losing their tread if you if you you know had the wrong kind of defense or or drove on them too hard. The new plastic wheels are supposedly fixed. We'll test that this season and let you know. Um, and it does have three inch wheels, which are, you know, it'll it's worse for obstacles, right? If you look at the 2020 game, it had, you know, two by one uh, uh, steel bars in the middle of the field. Max Swerve might struggle with that a little bit more than the other ones because it only has three wheels. Uh, so North Carolina team is running it. If you, you know, if, if you're running this and want to reach out for help, uh, we're running it. Uh, Valence is running it. 9150 was running it. There may be some others who did it last year that I'm not aware of, but those are the ones that I kind of know of. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, if you're running it and, and you know, have questions, please reach out. We we would love to help out. Um, all right. So West Coast product modules. This is, a, you know, this one has a lot of different configuration options. And so the price varies a little bit. Uh, I think it's probably a little more durable than uh, Rev modules. But again, not much testing. Um, it'll handle terrain a little bit better. It's more expensive and it doesn't include an encoder. So you only need to buy one of those on top of the 300 to $340. Um, and if you want to change the gear ratio, you got to buy those modules or you got to buy those ratios yourself. Uh, one other note uh, that I didn't include here, but we'll put in the slides. Um, the encoder on West Coast products modules uh, is a little bit unprotected. So you'll want to have a cover for that that makes sure that you know your encoder is protected from the elements. Uh, only two teams that I know of are running West Coast products, though I don't know all of them. I know 3506 is, um, and that's a team that's sponsored by West Coast products, actually. And 4829 Titanium Tigers is also running this. Uh, all right. So SDS, like I said, kind of gold standard, what the majority of teams that are running sort of are using. It is the most extensive, but it is, you know, all in all, probably the most uh, reliable, robust bulletproof option. It's got a lot of different options for what motors you use. It doesn't need Neo 550s like the like Rev module, so maybe a little bit more reliability on your motors. Um, and it, it's kind of the biggest and heaviest on your robot, which if you are you know tending to build robots that are really close to the weight limit, might be a problem for you. Uh, and kind of everyone who isn't running Rev and SD and uh, West Coast products is running SDS. So all of these teams, and I think like 10 to 15 more were running SDS uh, modules last year. Uh, so kind of my thought, overall thoughts on modules, if, if you know, you're looking to buy it, we've been happy with Rev modules. If you're looking for the thing that's just going to work for you the fastest and, and kind of the easiest uh, with the least amount of code support or electrical support, I think Rev modules are the way to go. Uh, if you're a little bit budget constrained and the kind of extra... Uh, $120, $120 per module of Rev or of, of SDS and West Coast products are going to be, um, you know, if that's going to present a challenge to you like it did for us last year, Rev is your option. Um, hopefully, we will each possibly be buying SDS modules before the 2025 season. We didn't have budget for that this year. But I do feel that kind of the ceiling of West Coast products and SDS is a little bit higher because of the bigger wheels. Uh, it allows, because it doesn't require spark max for steering, you can use kind of all-in-one motor controllers uh, and motors and motor controllers that I think probably have a little bit more reliability. Um, 
And they allow for some kind of advanced software by, by CrossFit Electronics to get kind of better position tracking and a little bit more power. Um, that said, if you want to build a tiny robot, RevSorb is absolutely the way to go. Um, I also generally think that CTRE, uh, who, who, you know, are the, uh, they, they make the motor controller for the Falcon and Kraken motors. They are kind of a year or two ahead of where Rev is uh, in terms of where their their kind of saw, uh, their motor controller functionality is. So I think they tend to have a little bit more fully. I think there are some advantages if you can go all Falcon or all Kraken. Now I'll note Xbox is all Neo right now, so um, this is more just from doing research. So uh, basically, I think Rev. I think all of these are great modules. I think every team I know with any of these modules is happy with them. Uh, I think most teams will do just fine with any of them, but this is kind of some of the differentiating factors if you're if you're looking at buying one or the other. Uh, any questions on different modules? And I kind of just I'm, I'm curious if y'all can put in the chat what modules your team has or or is is using. Kind of curious to see what the what the chat looks like. Um, So uh, let's uh, jump into some design and mechanical things. Um, really, the main thing with Swerve and, and with, with tank, there's only like five or six things that can go wrong with the tank drive, right? Um, there's really just not that much. There, there's only a few parts, and it, it's fairly simple to, to troubleshoot when something is wrong with it. That is not true about Swerve. It's just not. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces. There's four modules instead of two gearboxes. Each module has two motors. So it's, you know, easily three times the complexity. So if you're not following the build guide exactly, uh, including all of the notes on exactly which bolts to lock tight and exactly how tight to torque things and which bolts to be very careful not to over torque whether you're buying motors, you're going to find it very, very difficult to do this. So Across the board, attention to detail is absolutely critical with Swerve in a way that it really isn't with Tank. Uh, it is much more forgiving. So, you know, example on um, Rev Swerve, these bolts uh, on the Ultra Planetary, if you don't lock tight those and you're driving around on them and they fall out, it's going to fall into the gear set of the Max Swerve module and potentially like bind and destroy that, right? That's really not a failure mode that's possible with a kit of parts chassis, right? So just attention to detail is absolutely critical. Have checks and double checks, have quality control checks on your module assemblies, make sure that they all kind of feel the same when you're turning them, that you know no one mo module is significantly stiffer than others. Um, similar problem, by the way, with uh, an earlier version of the MK4i. So if you bought your modules um, in the last few months, uh, you've got the updated shafts, if not, um, there's a blog post by, by SDS, uh, that kind of details what went wrong with the initial shaft and what the failure mode is. And they're selling those very cheap for you to be able to, to get the corrected one. So just make sure you're, you're just attention to detail, following the guide as closely as possible. Um, Eastbots brought a second robot to rumble this year and I, I'm a remote mentor, so I can't help out with everything. Um, but, uh, you know, for about a week, they were telling me you were having trouble with our drivetrain. It either can't turn or it can't go straight, though the wheels are fighting each other. And I walked them through everything I could think of remotely, but I didn't get to see the robot until Rumble. And I did it. I looked at it. And it's like, hey, your your front left module is on the, the right side of your robot there, right? Um, with tank drive, that's just not a problem, and it's super easy to identify. But the way that failure mode manifested itself with Swerve was that it would translate fine but it couldn't rotate, right? And that's not at all obvious to me that that failure mode is caused by swapping left and right. So uh, yeah, attention to detail is critical. Design for swappability uh, and practice it, right? If you have a swerve module break or you have a motor on a swerve module break uh, in finals one of an event, you have eight minutes before finals two or you're not you're not driving that match. So you need to either be able to swap a module in eight minutes and literally practice your, you know, you know, it's, it's a pit stop, right? Practice doing this. Uh, and if you can't get it off in eight minutes, 
have an Omni wheel that you can just slap on there, and that motor, you know, that motor will kind of just do nothing that match. But it's better than dragging, you know, a high friction surface across the field. So, uh, you know, eSports almost, you know, we uh, we almost missed a match at Champs because we weren't ready to uh, to swap modules. We just didn't come prepared, and we barely got on the field. And if we hadn't got on the field, I don't think we would have made playoffs at that event, right? So, um, this is something that we're going to be focusing on. Your robot needs to be designed that you can swap this thing easily. And if you haven't practiced it by your first event and something goes wrong, uh, you're going to have a lot harder of a time, right? Uh, doing that swap in the heat of the moment between, you know, two playoffs matches than if you practice it and you know exactly what you're doing. So design for swappability, make sure your spare module, have a spare module, and make sure that spare module is, you know, ready with all the motors, all the motor controllers and everything it needs, uh, that it's, it's an eight minute swap. And, you know, I know an extra module is a lot of money, right? Potentially up to 400, you know, up to $410. Um, but what I'll say about that is that we pay $6,000 to play like 30 matches of FRC. Uh, and that puts every match at $200, right? Every match you sit out or don't drive correctly is 200 bucks. Um, it only takes two matches of saving you driving to to you know uh for to make that sort of module you know that extra module worth it uh also grease your modules periodically right um you know every every competition maybe do it once every hour of actual drive time do it once uh it'll just keep them running smoothly and happily uh and i would also put swerve module covers on your modules i'll add that to the slides uh just to protect them from carpet fuzz or bolts falling in or metal shavings falling in. There's some excellent uh, open source 3D printed covers for each module that'll just protect it from the elements. Uh, okay, so designing for swerve, right? So so tank drive, you've got a defined front and back, right? You're kind of locked into that. You're not scoring out the side of the tank drive unless you have a turret, right? But swerve opens the door to so much more. Uh, you know, this front can be anything, the sides can be anything. And then, um, Swerve enables you to build, in many ways, very simple robots um, in terms of the mechanisms, right? And if you, if you know Xbox robots, you know we like not doing everything, right? Swerve enabled us to be competitively successful last year with a robot that couldn't score high cones, right? So we chose to make that complexity trade-off in part because we thought Swerve could help get us the cycles that would make that mechanism simplicity worth it. So, you know, a few, few robots, I think, are really good examples of designing for Swerve, right? Uh, Citrus Circuit, 1678 and 2022, probably a top three team in the world. Um, and they didn't have a turret because they recognized that with Tank, they could do without that, right? Um, and their climber was mounted on the quote-unquote side of the robot uh, because that was the most effective use of space. Uh, 1533, 2019, a robot that we have, you know, we lost to a lot. Uh, you know, they have their cargo mechanism up front uh, and their hatch mechanism off to the side, right? Uh, so Swerve allows you to take advantage of multiple sides of your robot, allows you to uh, take better advantage of space, uh, and also just kind of re rethink how you design in that nothing is the front. You can go in any direction, right? 254 last year, you know, very cool robot, very complex robot. Uh, they couldn't take out of either side and then shoot out of, you know, the front, but with a turret, many directions. And then they climbed out of, you know, the last direction of that robot. So they're really making use of all sides. We are we'll, we will never build a robot this complex. Uh, but, you know, kind of the, the point stands of, you know, and I think 1533 last year also had their climbing kind of on a different direction than their, uh, than their, their intake and shooting. So, Swerve allows you to design robots differently, and part of Swerve is is taking advantage of it, is understanding that and, and getting that mentality set that you don't necessarily need to have a defined front and back. Uh, and you can simplify your mechanisms uh, to take advantage of Swerve. So, you know, for example, um, it's, it's uh, very helpful in a lot of games to be able to intake out of the opposite side of the robot that you score in because it reduces the number of times you have to turn around, especially in autonomous. Uh, with tank drive, turning around in auto is, is hard. Swerve, that's not a problem because you can just turn and move at the same time, right? So um, take advantage, you know, you're switching to swerve, take advantage of it uh, with, with how you design your robot. Okay, 
Uh, questions on any, you know, anything designing for Swerve or any of the mechanical things we talked about? All right, let's talk wheels. Um, this has been a bit of a hot topic recently. For SDFs and West Coast products, you really have two options for what you can buy. Uh, you can buy Colson wheels, which are uh, very long lasting, but a little bit lower grip and kind of easier to work with. You don't have to cut tread or bolt tread on. It's just a wheel that swaps in and out. Uh, these are also excellent, by the way, if you're running like outreach events on concrete, um, the, the tread will wear a lot worse. So Colson's are great. There are some teams that swear by them. Uh, you can buy these on Andy Mark or on, on you know, sword dry specialties. Um, that should say Colson wheels. Uh, so you're kind of making a trade off of wear versus um, versus friction here. So you know you, you you think about Formula One with soft, medium, and hard tires. Colsons are basically the hard tires. These are the soft of the mediums. Uh, these you will have to swap tread once an event, once every couple hours of practice uh, to keep it running well and keep you know making sure that you're getting the friction you need. Uh, and that's a bit of an involved process, but it's it's not too bad. Um, the last option is something that teams have started playing with in the last few months, and that is 3D printed TPU tires. These are extremely high friction and great wear, and kind of these, you know, the, the pattern here and the squishiness of it gives it a built-in suspension that'll allow it to ride over bumps better. Um, these are highly experimental, and we haven't seen them run in a full season. 4561 ran these at Thor, and they, they really like them, uh, and you can feel the friction difference. Uh, and they take a long time to print. So um, just throwing it out there that these are an option. These are things that you may see, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a high effort thing right now to get it done. If it ends up working, it's going to be the best option, but it's um, it's a lot of effort. Uh, for Max Swerve, uh, there's three options. Uh, the Rev plastic wheels, which uh, Rev sells. These are super easy to use. They're cheap, they're $5 per wheel. But like I noted, the previous versions of these wheels, the tread came off of the plastic, uh, both the 1.0 and the 1.1. So Rev has just come out with these 2.0s. They think they fixed the problem. I'm going to need some data to be sure about that. We're going to be running them all season. And if we see any problems with them, we'll we'll run something else. Um, the Then there's two options for kind of metal wheels that you can install tread on, which is more work. Uh, but they're a lot less likely to fail on you. Uh, and you'll get some more friction with them. Uh, so a little bit more grip. Uh, the thrifty bot wheel uh, is wider. So you'll get more grip because you know you just have more spikes sticking into the carpet. It's a little bit harder to install and it's not compatible with the alignment shape, but that's not a huge deal. Um, you can you can manually do that alignment uh, and, and it's not a too hard to uh, swap and they've got very good instructions on it. Um, so. I don't trust the Rev 2.0 wheels enough to only have these. If you're running Rev Swerve, I would strongly recommend you buy a set of each of these um, and be ready to put them on. Maybe you want to prefer the, the plastic wheels, but um, we got burned enough by the Rev plastic wheels that I, I'm not going into an event without having the metal wheels ready. Uh, finally, also teams messing with TPU tires. Same deal, except it's even more expensive experimental for, for Rev wheels. We tried this at Rumble in the Roads. We found out that the, the material we were using was way too soft and it only lasted like five matches. So we will be trying again with a harder compound. Um, but again, it's it's highly experimental. Um, kind of summarizing that, Tread and Colson's are going to work great for you. doesn't matter which one you use. If you want the easiest option, that's the fewest question marks, Colson's will do the job well for you. You might not need to replace them all season or maybe once in a season. Um, like I mentioned, rev plastic wheels might be fine. I don't trust them yet. If you have some of the old wheels, the 1.0 and the 1.1, um, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, do not use those at all at an event. Keep them specifically for outreach events, practicing in the shop. Do not trust the old wheels. Is it worth spending time printing these TPU wheels? Um, I would say that it's worth it in a couple of conditions. One is if you plan on playing a lot of defense. The second is if you have a lot of, you know, kind of effort to spare and uh, can build, can work on this without it taking away at all from your mechanisms. Um, 
we're going to be playing with these, but if I see this taking time away from the actual robot, we're going to can it and go back to, to what we know and try it again over the offseason. Um, a few notes, but on this, motors are getting more and more powerful. What that means is that drive acceleration and pushing power is no longer limited by the motor uh, and how much torque the motor can deliver like it was maybe five, six years ago. It's limited by traction. So I think the next arms race in FRC is going to be wheel friction. Uh, but I think the benefits are marginal. And I think that you really risk, you know, if you want to run a mo robot that can use more drive power, you have to be uh, ready to deal with the consequences of running more power and maybe not having enough power at the end of the match. So we'll be playing with them because we have 60 students and we have people who can work on this while we, you know, work on our mechanisms and not really take time away from both, but treaded wheels will be, will be our backup. And if it, if it starts taking away time from scoring and playing the game, we're not gonna use it. So if you're using tread, I would buy black neoprene uh, tread from McMaster Car or ThriftyBot or SDS. I'm also gonna provide uh, a link by the way, uh, to a spreadsheet that has all the products I'm talking about here and everywhere you can buy them from. I don't have that ready yet, but I will kind of when we send out the summary of this. Um, any questions on anything mechanical or wheels or module related? Okay. All right, so let's move on to electrical tips. Um, the biggest problem I see with, with um, you know, our team and other teams of CSA with, with Swerve is the CAN bus. There are just so many more motors on your robot, and the CAN bus has to go all the way around the robot now. Uh, so that's not probably the number one biggest electrical failure point I see, uh, just because there are so many more devices, so many more connections. Every device is a failure point. Every connector is a failure point. So uh, it's a lot more things that can go wrong. So as far as connectors, um, I really like these West Coast Products Lever Nuts. I think that they're kind of the easiest option to get students to make reliable connectors. Uh, crimping and soldering uh, are great, but often I think they're easy to get wrong. And they're easy to make a connection that looks okay, but actually isn't and has a little bit of resistance or is at risk of coming out. So uh, I think if you are a team that knows that uh, you've got very good crimping tools and students and mentors who can do it very reliably, uh, then keep doing that. You know, I would use locking connectors, so PWM clips or Molex latching connectors, um, but I would keep these handy as a, as a hot fix and as an option for, for permanently, you know, wiring it down. One thing I'll notice note with these, um, it's very important that you strain relief these and kind of make sure that it can't go anywhere uh, because they're a little bit heavy. And if you take a hard hit, um, this actually cost us a match of champs uh, where we had to do a hot fix. Uh, we didn't properly secure the lever nut down. Uh, we hit another robot really hard the lever nut flew and yanked out the wire uh, and you know we were driving on two wheels for the rest of the match, which is not very fun. So have these around, uh, consider using them, especially if crimping or soldering is something you struggle with, just make sure that you're strain relieving it, zip tying it down, making sure it can't fly anywhere. Um, make sure your status LEDs are visible, right? So if you've got a motor on the fritz, uh, that you're not, you know, having to dig into, you know, and, and stare into weird places to be able to see what the LED colors on, on a motor or motor controller are. Uh, you know, if you've got a, a motor that's got an intermittent CAN bus, uh, you want to be able to see that error code uh, and not have to, you know, take five minutes to figure out what which motor controller is the problem before even beginning to fix it. Um, same deal with mechanical, design for swappability and practice it. Uh, you should have a very easy disconnect can, disconnect steering motor power, disconnect uh, drive motor power. Uh, and those should be very clearly labeled and you should be able to do a full mechanical and electrical swap in eight minutes. Uh, a little more on the software side, 
because there are so many devices on the CAN bus, something that teams are running into is that it's saturating the bus and they're starting to get very laggy controls. Uh, and you can see in driver station, this utilization percent, if that's going over 80, 90%, you might start seeing problems. There are a couple of ways of dealing with this. Um, one is in software, both CTRE and Rev have options to kind of reduce how many messages each device sends, right? Rev will send you a lot of information that you don't need 50 times a second. So you can set that to say, only send me this once a second. And everything will work just as well because you're you're kind of cutting down how often messages that are you, you don't care about are being sent. So um, both Rev and CTRE have ways of doing this. If you're running into CAN utilization issues, do that. The other option is if you're using Falcons and Krakens, you can buy a Canivore, which is a high-speed USB CAN adapter, uh, and that will kind of just solve the problem for you um, at the cost of, I think, $100 for a Canivore, which personal preference is to just do it on the Rio, but I think there are there are very valid reasons to use a Canivore and to have a dedicated drive uh, loop for just your drivetrain. Uh, that way, if you have a, a failure on your drivetrain, it doesn't affect your mechanism or a failure of your, you know, if your intake motor comes out, um, of, if your intake can wire comes out, it doesn't stop you from being able to drive. So very good reason to buy a can of ore, but you don't need it. Um, if you don't have one, you can just kind of cut down how often each of them are sending status frames. Um, other stuff is, you know, same thing I said in attention to detail. You have to note and document what every can ID is, right? Your front right, you know, your front right steering motor and your front left steering motor should be labeled, and the motor controller for each should be labeled so that when you have to plug this thing in in the heat of the moment, you know exactly where everything is going. This should also all be documented. There's a very good spreadsheet by 401 that um, you know has a picture of PDH, and you can put uh, what motor it is, what can ID it is, what mechanism it is, any other information you want. I would have this printed out in your shop and in your pit. So that way, when you're like, oh man, I have to replace, you know, the front left steering motor, you don't have to trace the wire all the way back to know this is PDH slot 15. Uh, and it's running this motor controller and this motor. You just have that documented. Uh, and from the volunteer perspective as a CSA, when I'm helping teams in pits and I, I kind of look and see uh, a team that's got a motor that's drawing, you know, 100 amps. If they have this kind of documentation, it is so much easier to be able to help that team. Oh, the Canavore's three hundred dollars. Wow. Uh, yikes. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So clear labeling, attention to detail, so much more important with Swerve, just because your margin for error is so much smaller with how many more devices you have. Uh, okay, so Swerve also requires additional electronics uh, than kind of the basic and just motors and motor controllers. Uh, it requires a gyroscope or, or kind of more commonly an inertial measurement unit, which measures kind of the pitch, roll, and yaw of your robot, which is kind of where it's pointed in space. And that allows you to have field-oriented control, which basically says no matter which way the robot's pointing, if I push forward on the on the drive stick, it's going to move away from me. Uh, Whereas robot oriented, there's the design front, designated front of the robot. And when you push forward, it'll move towards the front of the rope. Uh, with Swerve, you should, it, it's driver preference, but I think most teams almost always run field oriented unless they're driving by camera. So 2022, if you were behind the, the hub and were driving by camera to try to intake balls, um, you might switch to robot oriented while driving by camera. Uh, encoders, there's a couple encoders. The one we care about in buying is an absolute encoder, and that's used to determine where your uh, rotation is of your module. So each of, the, each of your modules will need an absolute encoder. Uh, combining an IMU and the drive encoder and the turning encoder will give you a very precise estimate um, over short periods of time, like the 15 seconds of autonomous, uh, to uh, be able to tell where your robot is in space. So you have a few different encoder options. Um, I've kind of listed them out here, you know, a few notes on this. I think that the CAN coder isn't worth the money unless you are all into the, the kind of 
CTRE ecosystem and you're running all falcons or krakens uh, and you've got a canivore and a pigeon, uh, because if you run all CTRE, you, you have to pay $100 a year to unlock some advanced features that I think are eh, not worth it for most teams, including eSpots. We don't have any Falcons right now, so it's really a moot point. Um, so unless you're doing that, I would buy one of the other options. Personally, I would buy the Canon Coder. Um, it's got a lot of flexibility. It's not that much more expensive than the other options. It can connect to basically anything, but any of these will work just fine. I'll note that MaxWerb includes the Rev through Born Coder. Um, that's the only one that MaxWerb will work with, but it is included in the, the kind of $300 price tag. So any of these will work. Uh, my recommendation is the Canon Coder just because of how versatile it is. Um, but, you know, Thrifty Absolute will, will do the job just fine. And there are teams that run any and all of these that work just fine. The Rev through Born Coder doesn't work out of the box with uh, SDS and West Coast Products modules. You can do some modifications yourself to do that, but I don't really think that's worth the time. Uh, so IMU options, there's a few good ones. Um, the, the, you know, the main ones are the Pigeon 2, uh, the Analog Devices IMU, and the NavX 2. Uh, the Pigeon and the Navix are a little bit more fully featured. They have onboard sensor fusion, which is very useful uh, for a game like this where you're trying to auto balance. But it doesn't really matter for just regular driving where you only care about your, your kind of rotation angle. Uh, quick note on this, the Navix is inverted from the other two. So if you are using a Navix in code, you may have to put some negative signs in. Um, the Navix is 100 bucks, the Pigeon is 200 bucks, and the ADI IMU is 200 credits on first choice, but it's close to $300. So uh, if you have first choice credits and you need an IMU, I think the, the ADI one is just fine. Um, the main features of the Pigeon that I really like are that it, it kind of calibrates on startup and it doesn't depend on the robot being uh, totally still on startup for a few seconds. Um, but honestly, it's really not a big deal to just turn on your robot and make sure it's still for five seconds. Um, the other thing that's nice about the Pigeon, it's got a very nice case, um, which if your students are anything like mine, they like drilling over the robot and getting metal shavings and things, which killed our Navex last year. Uh, the Pigeon does protect against that. Uh, so, you know, it's a little bit more, more uh, idiot proof, which, you know, is helpful for, you know, people like me. Uh, there's another option that, doesn't exist yet, but might, uh, and that's the Canon gyro. Um, notionally, it's going to be $100. Uh, it'll be sold by Redux Robotics, who are the same people who make the Canon decoder. Uh, the product doesn't exist yet. If it exists, I, uh, you know, I kind of trust them to get it right. Uh, and it'll be about $100 and uh, comparable in stats to a pigeon. So. If this exists, I recommend the Canon Gyro. If it doesn't, uh, take your pick depending on, you know, cost, environment, and, you know, if you've got leftover first choice credits, which I know we certainly do. Um, all right, let's talk about the new motors. So there's two new motors for this year. Uh, Rev has released the Neo Vortex and West Coast Products has released the Kraken. Both of them are a significant power and efficiency upgrade over their predecessors, the regular Neo and the Falcon 500. So these will allow you to up your acceleration and top speed. Um, I think it requires a lot of drive practice to actually make use of this. You know, one of the things that I see a lot is a team that will run a robot faster than they have practiced for. And to compensate for that, they'll cut their, they'll just multiply their max speed by like 70%. Um, which actually cuts, if you do that, you'll cap your uh, your peak power output at 50%. So if you're going to run these motors, I think that's great. Just kind of make sure that you have the practice time to actually take advantage of the, uh, you know, the increased power it gets you. Both of these are around $200, by the way. Um, the Vortex should be a drop-in replacement for a Neo. Obviously, we don't have these motors yet. We don't know that for sure. Uh, something very nice about this is that the max swerve output shaft is kind of built into it. Uh, it's kind of a pain to get the, the max swerve, um, you know, the the kind of the key into the uh, pinion with max swerve right now. So this should be a quality of life fix on that. 
and the encoder cable uh, from you know the Neo to the Spark Max is is God, which is honestly the biggest selling point of these for me is that encoder cable has caused caused me much pain. Um, the Kraken requires new pinions because it's a different kind of output shaft and an adapter plate for SDFs. There are no max of Kraken um, pinions yet. There will be, but they don't exist yet. Um, if you're swimming in money, it certainly doesn't hurt to buy these. I do not think it's necessary at all. I think that you can be entirely competitive with old motors. They are plenty powerful. And kind of like I mentioned earlier, robots are traction limited. So you're not actually going to get more pushing power out of these motors because your wheel is just going to start spinning. Um, so they're nice. They're a quality of life upgrade, assuming that they all work fine. There is a risk to running them, right? When these motors came out initially, both of them had problems. They were resolved, but they had problems. And, you know, I think a lot of a lot of teams uh, waited a year because they wanted to let other teams work it out. So it doesn't hurt to buy it if you have the money, but I really don't think it's all that necessary. Um, I think they're cool. I'm looking forward to seeing how they work, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, any questions on anything electrical or about the new motors? All right, let's talk software. Um, so there's a few software options for these. For Max Swerve, the default code basically works out of the box. Uh, yes, the meeting recording will be shared. Um, so the max work code just kind of works. Uh, I think if, uh, you know, it took, we had our mechanical lead actually do our max work code last year because kind of that's how, you know, easy it was to follow the instructions, right? You need to change the IMU and obviously you need to set the CAN IDs and you need to say, this is how big my drive base is. Um, so you need to set a few constants, but the rev tutorial walks you through all of that. Um, the default rev kind of settings on slew rate, which is how fast a motor or the, the module can turn, are very conservative. I would increase those if you're running the metal wheels. The reason they added those in was because if you turned your modules too fast with the original wheels, the tread would come off. Um, and they have a GUI tool for helping you configure all the modules at once and kind of setting the zeroing right, setting the CAN IDs, all that jazz. Uh, the code that a lot of teams have been using uh, is based off of the 364 code base stock and swerve. Uh, and I provided a link there. Um, this code will kind of work with very little modification if you're running SDS or West Coast Products Swerve in kind of a standard configuration, uh, especially with Falcons. If you're running them with Neos, you might have some code to change, um, but it's not too bad. And they kind of have guides on their, on their repository for how to do that. Um, if you are all in on the CTRA system, and I think this is also makes code very, very easy to write, there's a CTRA swerve generator, which basically will walk you through every single module. Uh, you get to select which module you're using, you get to select what the can I use are, and it will actually generate all of the swerve code for you. But this requires you to be using all Falcons and Krakens and a pigeon and a can code. So if that's your setup, I would just do this. Um, it does require you to tune PID, but it also provides guides on how to do that. Um, some more options. There's something that was introduced last year called yet another generic Swerve library. And that's actually a Swerve code generator where they have a website where you can kind of input in all the different fun you know, features, right? On my front left module, I've got ID 11 and 12. I have a Neo on steering, a Falcon on drive, uh, and it will generate the Swerve code for you. Uh, I would kind of recommend this if you've got kind of a mix and match of different environments, right? So if you're all in on Rev and you've got Max work, just use that. If you're all in on, on CTRA, use CTRAs. This may be a good option if you've got a Falcon on drive and a Kraken on steer, or a, you know the other way around, or a thrifty encoder with all Falcons, right? I think um, if your programmers aren't quite comfortable modifying this code uh, to, to your setup, this is a very good option. I haven't personally used it, but I can say that the developers of it are very active on Chief Delphi. And if you just post a message in their thread, they'll they'll be with you pretty soon. Um, and uh, there's a pretty good guide on, on basically every of these uh, base codes to um, what you need to change 
main things are if your IMU is not the same as the default or your encoders are not the same as the default, change those. You have to update the physical constants of what wheel size you have, of what your drive base size is, what your max speed is, what your gearing is. Um, but those are all in one file and, you know, kind of just uh, follow the tutorial on this. Uh, there's a setup guide for base stock and sort of obviously uh, Yagsol will generate it for you. Final thing on software, uh, watch your units. Uh, Esports didn't have YAW PID until like District Champs because uh, we didn't realize that uh, the units were radians, not degrees. So our, our settings were way off. The default settings for most of these is meters, radians, and seconds. So the units of rotation will be in radians per second, not necessarily rotations per minute. Uh, so you can obviously do whatever you want. Just make sure that every piece of your code is talking the same set of units uh, and that you're paying attention that if you're using meters per second in one place, you don't suddenly change that uh, to feet per minute in another place. Uh, that's a very easy way that's kind of hard to track down of why your code can be you know, completely messed up. Uh, another thing is uh, logging and debugging. So tank drive has pretty intuitive behavior, right? You, you, you push the left joystick, the left wheel goes. You push the right joystick, the right wheel goes. With Swerve, I couldn't tell you if I push the right stick, you know, up forty to uh, up, you know, fifty percent of the left stick to the left. I couldn't tell you what position and speed each of my modules should be in, right? So it's important to have some level of visibility into the code because of how unintuitive the behavior is for any complex actions. So um, what I would recommend for this is Advantage Scope, which is just an, an app that lets you kind of view uh, and visualize what's happening in your robot uh, with WPI lib logging. With basically one line of code, you can get, um, you can store everything that you're putting into smart dashboard or network tables in uh, a log file at the end of the match or at the end of a practice session, and you can do it live. And so this is a view of Advantage Scope. You can see it's got a view of, you know, where the robot thinks it is on the field. And uh, this, this, you know, kind of uh, close up is where every module should be pointed and what its direction and magnitude should be and where the robot thinks it's pointed, right? So this is exceptionally helpful if you've got, you know, let's say a motor is off by, uh, uh, you know, one of your modules is off by 90 degrees, right? The first question you got to ask is, does the robot know it's off? And if the robot knows it's off, okay, that's a software problem. If it doesn't know it's off, uh, okay, do we have a constant wrong in software? Did our magnet for our magnetic encoder slip by a few degrees? Uh, do we have some configuration setting wrong? Or is our encoder having, you know, did it get zeroed in the wrong place? So with Swerve, I think it's really, really important uh, if anything goes wrong, and even then, if not, to have visibility. So I would recommend uh, just downloading Advantage Scope, putting everything into Smart Dashboard, put every wheel speed, every swerve module position, just put it into network tables, and then you'll be able to store it at the end of the match, pull out a flash drive, look at every single thing that happened in the match. You can even look at what's happening on a joystick, right? So how often has your driver told you at the end of a match, uh, I don't know, robot didn't work. When I pressed the button, it didn't do it, right? With this, you can see exactly what button was pressed. And if you log everything internal, you can see exactly how the robot responded. And so you can literally reconstruct what happened in a match frame by frame, which is exceptionally helpful for debugging what went wrong uh, and just, you know, improving your code. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, when something goes wrong in a match, this is an absolute lifesaver or when something's wrong in your shop. Having this kind of visualization is an absolute lifesaver and is actually fairly easy to get set up. I was surprised at how little work needed to be done because of how much work that um, Mechanical Advantage and the WPI lead team have put into this. Uh, these are some notes on by one of our, our, our driver last year. Um, you know, a lot of this is obvious. It's alignment's easier. It's more maneuverable. The one, the one key thing I'll note here is that for our driver switching from tank to swerve was fairly unintuitive. And he said it took him about 10 hours of on robot time doing obstacle courses for swerve to feel more intuitive than tank. So that's kind of the time that it took for him. Different drivers will be different. I think for a lot of uh, students who are driving for the first time, they actually find swerve more intuitive than tank. Um, and, you know, 
one thing I'll note is that when Swerve goes wrong, it is very hard to drive it on the fly. When Tank goes wrong, you can kind of limp your way around the field. Uh, autonomous, the, the thing that everyone uses is called Pat Planner. Um, it's a really, really helpful tool that we used last year to generate all of our paths. It um, has excellent documentation for how to generate paths and how to integrate different actions into them. So this is what we used to put together our three game piece autonomous routine last year. It's got even got an auto builder that can help you integrate um, you know, actions into your into your motion. So you can kind of just literally on a page draw what you want your path to be, both in rotation and translation. Uh, and then you can, you know, tell it, hey, at the end of this, do this command, right? You've got your commands in Swerve, or you got your commands defined in um in your code. You can tell it literally, do this, then drive this path, then do this. And if you're off by a foot in your first match, you can go in and you can drag this waypoint by a foot to the left. And then you'll you'll hit it bang on in the next match. So um, very useful tool. I would start getting used to this uh, soon if you're not already. Uh, it just makes life so much easier. There's a few quirks, um, but like with uh, like with the other libraries, the developers of it are very active on Chief Delphi. And if you have a problem with it, you can ask in the thread or just put in the NC mentor or, or, or you know overall Discord. And I think any of the large number of teams that are using it are are you know more than happy to help out with that. Uh, so that's all I have. A few miscellaneous things, you know, a few thank yous. Preston from 401 helped put a lot of this together. Uh, and then a couple of my students and one of my alumni helped a lot as well. Um, if we get a game where tank is bad or where Swerve is bad, just go back to tank. It's what we're going to do in all likelihood. If you're 1533, you can do swank. We're not 1533. We're not that cool. Um, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, and then one last thing, I, I was going to introduce more topics about reliability into this talk, um, but I actually did a, another talk last week on keeping your robot reliable. Uh, and it's got a lot of just kind of, you know, minor things for uh, things that will, that I've seen that will help keep you get your robot running every single match from the start of the season. So um, there's a link to that in here if that's something you want to watch as well. Um, other than that, uh, any questions about anything Swerve or eSports experience with Max Swerve or, or really anything else? Um, uh, yeah, okay, so uh, determining PID gains. So um, I think there's a, a couple options that you have here. One is using kind of pure PID, that's the simpler option. And with that, you can um, just kind of uh, manually manually tune it, right? So just use kind of a standard tuning method, really only with P and D. Uh, just increase P, you know, start at a small value that kind of makes sense. Uh, if your unit is, is in radians, uh, you know, a value of like 0.01 may make sense. Um, if it's in degrees, you'll obviously want, uh, or sorry, if your unit of measures degrees, a value of 0.01 may make sense to start if your radians. You know, it'll be it'll be different. Um, just kind of in, keep increasing P until you start oscillating around a set point and make sure you do this uh, with the robot on the ground for your final tuning. Uh, and then just increase D until you uh, increase the D term until you um, stabilize around that. So that's kind of a simple approach. Uh, one option, another option is to um, use a motion profile, uh, a trapezoidal motion profile, which kind of will help get you smoother control, but will require a little bit more work on calculating some of the physical parameters of your mechanism. Um, there's an... There are uh, some very good guides on this on the WPI Lib Docs. I don't think this is necessary. I think it's more than good enough to just start with a reasonable value um, and just increase it until you oscillate and then increase D decrease P until it's it's snappy enough for you. Uh, you can also look at the default gains uh, in base Falcon Swerve, and it'll be fairly similar for, um, it'll be fairly similar for Neos and Spark Baxes, as long as your, uh, 
as long as your um, units of measure are the same. So it's got, you know, uh, basically a few different options here based off of what module you have. So these are a pretty good starting point. Uh, and you can kind of go from there, just make sure your units make sense. Um, how difficult is learning suburban building? Uh, yeah, so if you're, uh, you know, kind of one of the things I talked about early is, are you, uh, are you planning on doing that this year, Taylor, or for next year? Okay, so if you're doing it for this year, um, building is really easy, just follow the guy, right? I mean, it's, again, there's attention to detail needed. Building, I think, is not significantly more difficult to assemble a sort of module than it is to assemble uh, a tank gearbox. Um, so physically building it, quite easy. In some ways, easier than tank drive. You take four pieces of tube, you bolt it onto your modules, you're done. Um, if you are struggling with software and you know, if you really don't have any programmers, I think it's going to be a challenge because if anything goes, you know, if you have to debug anything, that's where you're going to have problems. Um, and it's, it's a lot harder to debug support without a solid understanding of code. So mechanically, I wouldn't be too worried. Um, what I will say is I think you have to be willing to make a lot of trade-offs. If you're just starting it now, um, If you're just starting it now, I think you have to be very confident in your electrical reliability, your ability to put together solid connections, your ability to program and debug, um, especially if you don't have any, I'm not sure where your team is. If there's a team nearby you that is running the modules you're running, I think your life gets a lot easier because they can physically come over. Um, if you're using Maxverb, obviously we're happy to help. I think the main thing is if you're going to do it, you have to say from the start, we are going to build a much simpler robot than we would have built with tank because we are putting significant effort into our drivetrain. Um, I generally don't think it's worth putting a ton of effort into a drivetrain. I would rather put it into scoring. Uh, but I think kind of if you meet these factors and you have someone willing to help if you run into any problems, then I think I think you're going to be okay. Um, if not, then you might run into some challenge. Then, then I it might not be worth it. And I, I'm I'm absolutely serious about like one hour a week of drive practice from kickoff day. Uh, I think that's what it takes in terms of practice to make driving score better than driving than an experienced driver on tank. Any other questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so a, a, meeting, a, a recording will be shared. Uh, I think um, Maria and Julia will will send that out when it's ready, and um, I'll post it in the the mentor Discord and the you know overall Discord as well. I'll jump in and agree with that. That yes, uh, First North Carolina will get this recording out to the group. We want to thank everybody for coming tonight, and definitely thank them all in for doing this. And uh, I'll drop my email in the in the chat if any of you have any follow-up questions um, or, you know, uh, Max Word is where we can help out the most. But if you have questions about any other modules, I can connect you to teams that are, you know, running those modules, hopefully in your area, um, so that you can get, you know, in-person help you need uh, to, to get this, this working. Okay, awesome. thanks for coming. Uh, it was great, uh, great having you.